Getting lost is not a pleasant experience. Um, and I'm talking about getting lost when it's like you're in your car and it's late at night and this was before uh, GPS and mobile phones and Google and Waze. I'm talking about the street directory. Uh, you millennials, you don't understand the street directory, but us over 40, uh, we, are, we grew up with the street directory. And if you were going to someone that you'd never been before, there was a whole thing. There was no search function on the street directory. No, you had to go to the back and then you had to find the street uh, of which there could be up to like 15 different Murray avenues, but you've got to find the right Murray Avenue, and then you go to, okay, so it's on page 126, uh, row M, column four, uh, column four. okay, 126, uh, yep, and then you've got to find the little street, okay, I got that there, now where do I get, come from? Okay, so map, map, map 132, and it's okay if you're going from east to west, right, but if you were going north to south, you, you go up, and then you had to turn to page 72, uh, and going up again, you have to page 32. It, it was really complicated, right? So you would get lost, and it was a lot of stress because you couldn't just call a friend. You couldn't just uh, look up where to go next. There was no highlighted path of left, right, and 700 meters, take the third exit. No, there was none of that. Uh, you, if you were lost, you were lost, and you had to hope that there was someone around you that you could ask directions. Uh, it was very, very unpleasant experience and a lot of anxiety and stress. And then finally, when you drove onto a street that you finally recognized, there was a sense of relief. For you are gone from lost to found. And that's one of the things we're looking at today. But then I can't really talk about the concept of lost and found without telling you the story about Sam and Target. Uh, now, it's one thing to lose a toddler in Woolworths or Coles. Because those shops have long aisles. Like, he, he can be 30 metres away from you, but you've still got him in a line of sight. It's not that bad. But in Target, Target has all these little uh, shelves. And so he does two quick turns and he could be anywhere in the store. And of course, that's what happened when I was looking after him. And this is our, Sam is our firstborn. Uh, so we were not yet adept at losing children uh, that we became. And so there's a lot more stress involved. So I remember pacing all around Target and, and calling out Sam's name. And of course, he was a toddler. He was not about to say, here I am, daddy. Um, I was really freaking out. And of course, in my mind, on loop, were horrific scenarios that could be occurring to my poor son at that moment. Um, and I was running, I was pacing, and, and I, there was a lady, and she was just standing looking at a pole. And I thought that was weird, but I did not have the brain activity to compute that because I'd lost my son. And then she said, oh, have you lost a child? And I said, yes, I have. And she said, oh, he's just here. Sam was behind the pole uh, at the card section of Target, taking out a card, looking at it, and putting it next to him. At this stage, he had massed a significant pile of cards that he had already gone through. I, I, I nearly teared up. I, I did tear up, I, I believe. I was so overcome with relief because my son, who was lost, is now found. I was so thankful to the lady and so thankful I didn't have to make phone calls to the police and, and my wife. I, I found my son. And that's the kind of exuberance and joy and relief that the good shepherd has when he finds his sheep who is lost. That the woman has when she finds the coin that was lost. That God has when he finds the sinner who is lost. When he finds us who are lost. Who have walked away from him and he brings them back. Today we're looking at two passages of scripture. We're looking at the cost and the lost. So we start... Uh, so. We'll get to the, the loss, but we start with the cost. And in this way, we're kind of looking at our responsibility to God and then what God does for us. Our cost to follow him and the way that God seeks and searches and loves and cares. How we respond to him, how he responds to us. Okay, well, let's get into the passage. Verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Jesus is drawing big crowds. And we know that this is going to quickly recede. So you've got the uh, Palm Sunday crowds and then you've got the cross crowds, right? We know that these, aren't, these are more fans than followers. But right now, massive crowds. Uh, think, if you're older, think the Beatles when they came to Australia. If you're younger, think Chris Hemsworth when he walks to get the newspaper in Byron Bay. But Jesus wasn't after big crowds. He didn't want followers, fans. He wanted followers. He wanted the devout, not the interested. He wanted the committed, not the curious. And so what we find in scripture that Jesus often does is first he woos and people come to him. 
And then he winnows and he, and he uh, describes actually what it means to be a Christian. He describes the cost. He describes the difficulties. And as a result, a lot of the people who were attracted to him by the miracles and the cool, cool parables and stories that he was saying were driven away by the winnowing. Whether the, uh, on the threshing floor, the wheat went up and the, and the seed would fall and the shaft would be blown away. And that's kind of what he's doing in this passage. When he's describing the cost of what it means to follow Christ, he is winnowing the fans from the actual followers. They're interested from the devoted. So he starts, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I was speaking uh, to a church person uh, recently about this, how there's perceived contradictions in the Bible. And you would think on the surface level that this is one of them. Because Jesus here is saying that I have to hate Liz. I have to hate Sam Joshua Grace. I have to hate Nana and Pop. Like, is that exactly what Jesus is saying? And how does that stand with passages like the Golden Commandment, love your neighbor as yourself? Or what Jesus had said in the parable of the Good Samaritan, love everyone. How do I have love, love, love and hate at the same time? And there's different commentators say different things, but I think the easiest answer for this is that our devotion and our love for Christ puts our love for our family pales in comparison. This is so great and this is uh, so much less because Jesus is the highest priority. Jesus is number one. Jesus is our firm commitment. That the comparison is that this might look like hatred sometimes because of the big gap it is between the way that we put Christ. Jesus is saying we must put Jesus number one. Number one. Core. Center. No other priority other than. And at times this will mean um, saying no to our family. Saying no to our parents. Saying no to what our children want. Saying yes to Jesus. And so putting him number one and that gap, that comparison is what is on view here. And then Jesus continues, verse 27, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So not only must Christ come above family, but we're also to carry our own cross. But a big question for me this week was, well, what does that actually look like? What does it look like for me to carry a cross? I mean, in the church, we have a couple of crosses, like little ones. Do I go around and take this into Clempton Park Plaza with me and that is me carrying the cross? Well, no. The person who carried the cross as our model and as our guide is Jesus. And he carried the cross as he went up the hill um, to die. And so the carrying the cross is symbolic of suffering and pain that we will go through if we put him first, if we say yes to Christ. But that's what it, call, what it means to be a Christian. It's not all joy. It's not all grace. It's not all uh, bells and songs and whistles. It's hard. We looked at this the other week. It is a narrow door, not a wide open one. And the carrying of the cross is the suffering that comes along with, uh, with following Jesus and with putting him first and with denying ourself in order to do so. Bearing our cross means to be Christ-like. And that often involves suffering and pain as a result when we are putting him first, denying ourselves, denying others. So then we get two uh, parables come in here. And you can see the winnowing that Jesus is doing because he's raising the bar of what it means to follow him. And so as he has raised that bar and said, to follow me, you have to uh, deny your family and you have to carry your own cross. He then gives two examples of the need to calculate the cost before doing the commitment. Um, You need to know what you're getting into as a Christian and have a real understanding of that before you say yes. And these two parables are pointing to that. Uh, Verse 28, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish it. There's a house down the street. 
And uh, we've been here over five years now, and as long as we've been here, there has never been a tenant, a resident in that house. Um, every once in a while, workers will come in and do something, uh, like it was in a lot worse position five years ago, and the foundation's built and the walls are up, um, but it's not complete. It doesn't have a front door yet, and no one has lived in it for that time. Uh, we inquired about this from, from a neighbour once, and the neighbour said uh, they started building, but they didn't have enough money to finish it. And so that is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. What could have happened in that scenario is that they didn't uh, calculate the cost accurately. They may have got some dodgy estimates. Um, but when it, when it came time to pay the bill, they were unable to, and so the house remains empty. In this culture, that would mean that they would be a laughing stock. Uh, it's much less so in ours, but would have been in that culture. And so the idea is that we must know what we're getting into as a Christian and not go into it blindly before we take the label, before we commit to Christ. Then the second metaphor is similar, verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Something that was quite... Uh, newsworthy recently was the Russia's war against Ukraine. And when this started, everyone expected it to be an absolute domination from Russia. Everyone expected it to be over in a matter of weeks and Ukraine uh, to completely fold um, and Russia to take over. But that's not what's happened. Um, Russia, I think there was an overestimation of Russia's ability, skill, and training of troops, an underestimation of the resistance of Ukraine. The cost wasn't calculated correctly by Russia before it went into war, and as a result, we have a war that has gone, that has affected the entire globe in some way, and has gone on for months and has no, uh, no uh, prediction of closing anytime soon. And that's because Putin went into war without accurately counting the cost. Jesus is saying here, before you call yourself a Christian, before you take the label of being a Christian, understand what it will actually cost you. And he kind of sums that up best in verse 33. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, Calculate the cost, calculate the cost, and this is the cost, everything you have. Um, this is not a popular verse in the Bible. I actually looked it up and no one has uh, a tattoo of this verse on their personage. Uh, a lot of people have uh, Luke one thirty seven with God, nothing is impossible, uh, but they don't have the hard one of this, follow me and it will cost you everything. And it's really hard to water that down. It's hard to dilute that into something socially acceptable and comfortable. For this is the most hardcore part of discipleship, the most hardcore part of what it means to actually follow Jesus. Now, when it says this, it isn't meaning that we become saved and we literally just give everything that we own away, um, because that didn't happen in the Bible. Um, wealthy women who were Jesus' disciples did not give up all their wealth, but rather used their wealth to support Jesus and his ministry. John the Baptist required tax collectors uh, not to surrender their possessions, but to work ethically. Uh, Zacchaeus did not give up all that he owned, but gave half to the poor and paid back those he had cheated four times. John Mark's mother used her large home for a church assembly. So we need to not just literally cut and paste, right? But it means we have to be willing to leave everything. Father and mother, career, possessions, comfortability, house, Give it all to Jesus if he asked. The cost of being a Christian is high. We should never lower that bar. And at some times it will even include our life. Uh, I was listening to the news this week and uh, there was a story of a Ukrainian uh, person who had been arrested by Russia because uh, he had put photos of the Russian tanks on his social media feed. The Russians arrested him, put him in prison, and tortured him and said, if you don't put a pro-Putin message on your social media, we will kill you. And the man said, I will not um, reject my nation. 
I will not forsake them. I will not turn my back on them. I will not do that. And he was willing to die for his country. How much more should we be willing to die for the God who saved us, for the God who died for us, for Jesus who loves and cares for us? He was willing to die for national patriotism. How much more should we be willing to die for God? Again, often what we do is, I give all this to you, but let me keep this. Let me keep this career. Let me keep this relationship. Let me keep this dream. Let me keep this desire. Let me keep this. But Jesus doesn't ask for most. He asks for us to be willing to give all. That's um, the first half of our passage this morning. But what do we take out of it? I think the first thing is that we need to be... Um, careful of taking the label of Christianity without the lifestyle. Large crowds were coming to Jesus and he raised the bar as a result. Now I have hobby horses. If you've been here long enough, you will know what some of them are. But one of them is nominalism. People who take the name of Christianity without actually living it. Saying, yes, I'm Christian, but I don't have any fruit to back that up. Jesus here is raising the bar and, and saying, we need to count the cost and saying it is hard to be a Christian, and saying you need to be willing to do that if you're going to call yourself a Christian. As a family, uh, we've been watching Amazing Race Australia uh, this um, at, the, at the moment, and uh, we really enjoyed watching it as a family, but there's this one group um, that are labelled church friends. Um, before they start the race, they, they pray, and, and the cameras picture it. Um, and I really struggled with this, because they... One of them in the team took the label of Christianity, but if you looked at the way that they acted throughout the race, it was hard to see Christ. It was hard to see love. It was hard to see Christ-like behavior, selfless behavior. It was hard to see how in their life, God was number one and not the race. It was hard to see Jesus. And I'm sitting there as a Christian and I'm just going, no, don't do that. You wanna go on the race, go on the race, that's fine. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, especially in public, then be a Christian. And I'm not judging her. It's a crazy situation to be in. Really difficult. So much pressure. And the TV is editing it for controversy and to get eyeballs on screens. Like, I get that. But there is so much damage has been done when people take the label without the lifestyle. People have walked away from the church because that person is not acting Christ-like. And they're not acting Christ-like because they didn't calculate the cost. They're not acting Christ-like because they haven't truly given God everything. If we're going to take the label, we've got to take the lifestyle. We've got to be a follower of Jesus, not just a fan. We've got to be walking in his path, doing what he did, willing to do the hard yards of discipleship. The second application of, of this calculating of the cost, though, is I think as a church... I think sometimes we need to raise the bar of what it means to be a Christian. I've been listening to some uh, church po leadership podcasts recently, and there's been a big push on discipleship. They keep raising the question is, are we raising disciples? Are people who attend your church growing in their faith? Are they becoming more mature? Are they dealing with the sin in their life? Are they becoming more like Jesus or are they not? And what is mentioned is one of the big um, weaknesses is that we, uh, as a pastor, uh, as a church, there is a tendency and a desire to water down what Jesus asks for to get attendance. Now, yes, you might have sin in your life, but I'm not going to address that because I want you to come. I want you to serve. I want you to be a part of that. And I think that is a temptation for me as well. And it's not good. <laughs> I can't, I shouldn't be diluting the bar. I shouldn't be setting the bar lower for you. I, I should be putting it at the bar where Jesus puts it. He says, deny your family, deny everything you have. He says, carry on the cross and that'll mean suffering. That's where he puts it. Why am I pushing it down? As a church, sometimes there is a tendency and a danger for us to do that. And I think that's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what Jesus wants. It is hard to be a Christian. If that means people leave, then they might need to leave, and that's okay. But I need to be true to what this says. In high school, I, um, I, had, the, I had a difficult high school experience. 
Um, and so in high school, I had uh, this one teacher who I loved. His name was Mr. Pegg. And he was there, at, uh, he's been at Inabara, that's the school that I went, and he's been there for like ages. He's been there for decades. Um, and he's uh, seen so many hundreds of young kids come and go through his school. And Mr. Pegg had a huge influence on my life. And so um, after uh, high school, I ended up at the same church that Mr. Pegg went to. And as the years went on, I ended up doing ministry with Mr. Pegg. And, and I, I loved him and, and we did leadership together. He'd go on camps. He was my uh, mentor at one stage in a capacity. And it was great. I had so much respect for Mr. Pegg. And he could see me and what I did and, and the way that I was working to be Christ-like in my behavior. Um, and then we left Menai, and about eight years after I had been at that church, I, I, we were at the Innerborough Fate. Uh, it was an open day. And I met Mr. Pegg. And I was so excited to see him, you know, because he'd been, played such an important role in my life. And Mr. Pegg asked me, um, are you still a Christian? Do you still go to church? I was so offended. I was so cut. It's like, don't you know me? <laughs> We did life together. You know me for decades. We did ministry together. You're asking me that question? And at my, first initial, initial, uh, my first reaction was stubborn and arrogant. Um, but I was thinking about it afterwards. Mr. Pegg had seen hundreds of kids every year. And he had seen hundreds of kids identify as Christian. Take the label. Hundreds of kids say that they are Jesus and serving him and going to church. And then he's seen hundreds of kids walk away from the church. Hundreds of kids walking away from Christ. Hundreds of kids that he would have at one stage thought were hot fall away and grow cold. And so from his experience, from his reality, it made sense for that question to ask. Because of course he had to. Because he had expected so many people to fall away. And I think one of the reasons they fall away is that we don't raise the bar high enough. We don't. There can be a tendency for the church to talk about the good bits of Jesus without talking about the difficult bits of Jesus. Jesus is saying quite clearly here, to follow me costs you everything. When we don't calculate the cost, that's when people start falling away. And, and I don't know... Um, it's not my position to judge. It's not my position to say who is in and who is out. And um, that's not the call here. But my thing is, are we willing to give away everything? All right. So that is the cost. And now we look at the lost. Uh, with these two parables, Jesus is um, setting up the stage uh, for the parable of the lost son. Um, well, it's the parable of the prodigal son. You might know it like that. I, I prefer the title parable of the lost sons because they're both lost in different ways. Now, we actually did a year ago a three-week series on the parable of the lost son. So we're not going to touch that parable today. So it's worth noting that these two parables link to that and point to that. But we're not actually going to look at that next week uh, or in this series uh, because I've covered that before. And one of the sermons on that series is on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> but let's look at the lost uh, sheep and the lost coin. It's interesting. When we were looking at the uh, parable of the mustard seed and the yeast, uh, Jesus took a parable from the man world and a parable from the woman's world. And here with the sheep and the coin, he's doing the same thing. And I love that because he's not amping one gender above the other. He's saying both genders are important in Jesus's eyes. Often um, Christianity is seen as a patriarchal religion and yeah, it's all pro-men and it doesn't love women. And yet Jesus here is going, no, 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 women are just as important. Let me tell you uh, the same, uh, same idea from two different angles. And he's done, he does that quite a bit. Um, so the other thing is when we get to a parable, we need to look at why um, the parable is given, the context in which it's given. Because that context often helps us um, understand the parable, right? So we saw this with the parable of the excuses, or what is known as the parable of the great banquet. Um, it started with Jesus at dinner with the Pharisees, and one of the Pharisees says, how awesome will it be when we get to be in heaven? And Jesus goes through the parable of great excuses, yeah, are you actually going to be there? Or are you actually one of the guys giving me an excuse, and as a result, I won't see in heaven? Um, so... We need the context to understand the parable. Here is a similar thing. And the context is found in, found in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
So with large crowds of 1425, Jesus wasn't just attracting the morally upright and the good people of society, but rather the socially undesirable were flocking to him in droves. Uh, And at that time, it was tax collectors. Uh, A modern version of this would include uh, traffic cops, uh, debt recovery, um, insurance salesmen, politicians, Silicon Valley bros, middle management, and big oil CEOs. Um, But Jesus is open for all. We saw that when he went to a dinner with the Pharisees, who he knew he was walking into a trap. And we see that here with him uh, loving and caring for those that the world does not. So these parables kick off when the Pharisees are offended and shocked at what Jesus is doing, that he would eat with such people. For eat, to eat with people of this level is to say that you fully accept them and embrace them. And the re- religious leaders like themselves would never want to embrace or connect themselves with such a uh, 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 hive of scum and villainy such as these. And yes, that is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is embracing. He's loving. He's serving and caring for those who at that time it was not appropriate to love. Now verse 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. There are a hundred sheep, one gets lost. Uh, A commentator spoke to a shepherd um, and asked him, how does a sheep get lost in a situation like this? And the shepherd said, what happens is the sheep starts to nibble a bit of grass and then it nibbles another tuft of grass and then it nibbles a t- another tuft of grass. Then it goes under the hole in the fence and nibbles another tuft, another and another and another. And then it looks its head up and can't see the shepherd because it has nibbled its way to lostness. And I think we can see that in people's lives as well. They make one bad decision and then they make another bad decision and then they make a step away from Jesus and, and they, don't, uh, put, uh, they don't take steps towards Jesus but further away and further away and further away. And before you know it, they look up and Jesus is nowhere because they've walked away from him. We have a possibility of nibbling our way to lostness. And in that way, we are the lost sheep. We can be the lost sheep, and that's something we need to avoid. But it's interesting to see what Jesus does in terms of the lost sheep. And so the shepherd leaves the 99. He's so worried about that one sheep, so concerned about that sheep. He cares so much for that sheep, loves that sheep so deeply that he is willing to go for that sheep to leave everything behind, to find that sheep and bring him back. Um, In the various kids' Bibles, he goes over hill and over dale. Uh, He travels everywhere looking for the sheep and and finally finds him. Some children's Bibles have the image of the sheep falling down a cliff. And so Jesus, the shepherd, has to climb the cliff to get the shepherd. He puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries him back to the flock. I like the idea of that. You've got a sheep... And if you are putting that sheep on your shoulders, then that is heavy. Then that weighs a lot. It would have been a lot harder for the shepherd to walk back to the flock because he's got the sheep on his shoulders, but he so cares for the sheep. He so wants that sheep to be part of him, to be part of the flock yet again, that he will go that extra mile for that sheep. And that's what Jesus does for us. If you are lost, Jesus loves you. If you are lost, Jesus is searching for you. If you are lost, Jesus is looking for you to be found again. And he will care for you and bring you back into the flock if only you let him. Jesus is the good shepherd. The one who loves his sheep so much, he will leave the 99 for the one and will put that one on his shoulder. The one who is broken, the one who is injured, the one who is damaged. And he will love and he will care. And he wants to do that for you if you've walked away from him. Uh, Then when he has found the sheep in uh, in verse 6, then in verse 7, he celebrates and rejoices, gets a party of people together and they rejoice. And verse 7 is this, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The rejoicing. The rejoicing here is in a direct contrast to the grumbling of the Pharisees. Uh, The rejoicing is a celebration. And this is a reminder for us too. That one, when a person goes from lost to found, that we are to also celebrate. Not question their morals, not question their history, not question their standing. Uh, Yes, they're saved, but it wasn't in our church. It wasn't in our denomination. It wasn't in our country. 
No, 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 no. When they go from lost to found, we're all going to the same place. If you have accepted Christ, if you put him first, we're all going to the same place. So let's celebrate that. As one church, let's celebrate that uh, and rejoice as angels rejoice. Uh, Then the next parable is the coin, and it's a very similar idea. Verse 8. Well, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Ten silver coins. Uh, That amount could be used to buy a sheep or a fifth of an ox, and so it's a decent amount. Um, And it's implied in this story that the woman is not rich, and so this is significant money for her. But she doesn't lose the coin and go, well, I've got nine others. It's all right. I'll be all right. She lights a lamp, she gets on her hands and knees and she searches the room, searches the house, goes from every corner to find this one coin and when she does, she celebrates. She parties. She gets people together and rejoice <clears throat> and she's happy. In, these, in both of these parables, you have an, a person who has lost something and searches. And in that way, that is the good shepherd. And I think it's helpful to read these parables with Ezekiel 34 in mind. Um, Ezekiel 34, particularly in verse 4, the weak you have not, this is referring to, um, in in this parable sense, it's referring to those like the Pharisees. Um, The weak you have not strengthened, Ezekiel 34, 4. The sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought. Pharisees, the Pharisees were doing this. People were leaving and they didn't care. People were leaving and they uh, were fine with it. They didn't seek them out. They were like, good riddance. Man, it's not the, man, it's not the call of the, the good shepherd. The good shepherd's heart breaks. The good shepherd cares. And we see what the good shepherd does in verse 11. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock When he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek, the strong, I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. If you are lost, I I believe Jesus wants to tell you today, there is always a path back to him. There is always a path of him picking you up and putting him on your shoulders. There is always opportunity for you to repent and and return to the flock. And it might not look the same that it previously did, and that doesn't matter because find a church, find a a pastor who preaches the Bible, um, grow in Christ where it doesn't matter, but there is a place for you. There is a possibility for you to re-enter the kingdom of God. And there's uh, a whole theological argument there. Ask me about that later. But, But this is what I believe it's saying. There are people who've walked away from the church and Jesus wants them back. And Jesus wants them back in a real relationship with him. And Jesus wants them to be in a position where they are willing to deny their family and to give Jesus everything. If you are lost, there is no, there's always, sorry, there is always a possibility of you to return to Jesus. And he wants you to. But I think there is another um, application here. Because you kind of have this contrast, grumbling Pharisees and rejoicing shepherds, rejoicing women. And I think as a church, there can be another tendency that we have a cold heart towards the lost. Cold heart to those who have walked away, cold heart to those who do not know Jesus. And we go, well, that's their decision because that's what the Pharisees were doing. They had no heart for the tax collector. They didn't, had no care for the sinner. But Jesus does. And as a result, so should we. I think it can be easy that we sit in the pews and we stay in our, our little comfortable Christian ghettos and we don't go out seeking and we don't go out searching and we don't go out looking. Jesus searched. We need to search. We need to care. Our heart needs to break for those who do not know him. Oh, they're too hard. They'll never accept Jesus. Are you minimizing God again? And I'm preaching this to myself. Nothing. We think things are impossible until they become possible. God is the God of the impossible. So sometimes we need to just go out. Sometimes we need to search. May God break our hearts 
for those who do not yet know him. May God break our hearts for those who are lost. There are two points here. That we would go into Christianity knowing what it costs. Being willing to sacrifice family, to carry our cross, and uh, 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 to give God all. And then we have the lost. Jesus is the good shepherd. He wants you back. And for us as a church, we need to be searching too. We need to have a warm heart towards those who don't yet know him. Please let us pray. Dear Lord, he who has ears, let him hear. Through your Holy Spirit, get this message and truth to the people that need to hear. Help us, Lord, to do something with it. Help us, Lord, to be honest with ourselves about the cost of following you. May we not go lukewarm, for you will spit that out. May we not go half or be in limbo, for that is not what you want. Help us, Lord, to go full on for you. Help us to evaluate where we are in, with you and to consider our salvation with fear and trembling. Show us, Lord, in the ways that we're just not, that we're trying to do a comfortable Christianity where our cross lies next to the television, where we're not actually giving everything. Show me, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those who are lost and hearing this, that they will be found, that we would rejoice as a result. In your name, amen.